Question 10 from Section 1 of the 2018 Higher Physics Examination. A proton enters a region of magnetic field as shown. On entering the magnetic field, the proton and we're given five choices. Which direction will the proton go? Now, first of all, a proton is a positive charge. And secondly, the magnetic field is pointing into the screen as we look at it. So how are we going to decide which direction the proton goes? Well, we'll have to rely on this person here. Elvis, the most famous singer in the world. And Elvis, when he finished his concert, there would be an announcement on the tannoy that Elvis has left the building and everybody all cried out quite quickly, are you positive? And that's how we remember it, because if it's a positive charge going into the magnetic field, we have to use the left-hand rule. And the left-hand rule says that the magnetic field, you point in its direction. In this case, you point into the direction, into the screen as you look at it. Your second finger is the current. That's the direction of the charge, which is going from left to right. And therefore, the force in this particular case must be upwards. So the actual proton is deflected upwards. And that's that one here. So the question is, is deflected to the top of the page. Now that's quite hard to explain in one dimension. So what I'm going to include here is a little movie to show you quite simply where we use our hands. So watch the little quick movie and you'll get the reason why we can figure out where a proton goes in a magnetic field. Remember, Elvis has left the building. Are you positive? If it's a positive charge, we use our left hand. The thumb is the force. The first finger is the magnetic field and the second finger is the current. And if we arrange that into diagram, we see the force is acting upwards. So the proton is deflected to the top of the page. Question 11 from Section 1 of the 2018 Higher Physics Examination. A nuclear fission reaction is represented by the following statement. And we're given the statement as shown. The nucleus represented by X is one of the following five. Now, in order to do that, we have to understand this little bit of revision. There is a typical symbol for a nucleus. X is the chemical symbol for that particular element, which the nucleus is part of. M, the top number, is the mass number. That really is the number of protons plus neutrons. And the bottom number is the atomic number. Now, in a nuclear reaction equation, as shown, the most important fact is that the sum of the mass numbers on the left-hand side must equal the sum of the mass numbers on the left-hand side. And the Likewise, the sum of the atomic numbers on the left-hand side has got to equal the sum of the atomic numbers on the right-hand side. So to do that, we just simply make up a little table like this. So here we begin with the mass numbers. So let's look at the total mass numbers on the left-hand side of that equation. We start off with the neutron, which is 1. And then we've got another 235, which is going to give us a total mass number on the left-hand side is 236. Now if we go towards the right hand side, we start off with the barium, that's got 141, plus the missing nucleus, which we've given a mass number symbol as M, so we've got to add on M, and plus the three neutrons themselves, so we've got to add on three, remember there's three present there, so it's got to give you three. So the total on the right hand side is 144 plus M. So you've got a little equation here, and all you have to do is go 236 must equal 144 plus M, and just subtract from the other side, the 144, 144, and that's going to give you a value for M, and therefore M should have a value, if you work it out, to be 92. So we now know that element X has got a mass number, of 92 to keep up the balance. And you do the same thing with the atomic numbers. You put the little table to stand for the atomic numbers like that. And you just fill in the sum of the atomic numbers on the left-hand side. So we've got 0, 
to begin with, plus 92. And that's going to give us a total of 92. Go to the right hand side and we've got uh, 56. We've got the missing one, which we've given the symbol N. And we've got three lots of nothing, which is nothing. So the total has got to be 56 plus N. So if you make up that little equation, you can see that uh, 92 uh, must equal 56 plus N. So therefore N, the missing number, is quite simply equal to 92. Take away 56 and N is going to give you an answer of 36. So 36 goes in the atomic number. So we've got this element, 92 mass number, atomic number 36, and look down the list, and lo and behold, it's that one there. 92, 36, Krypton. Question 12 from section 1 of the 2018 Higher Physics Examination. The irradiance on a surface 0.5 metres from a source, a point source of light, is I. The irradiance on a surface 1.5 metres from this source is, and you're given the five choices. Now, if you look up the data book, the equation for the irradiance is given in this form. The irradiance I equals K divided by D squared. Now, what that really means is that the irradiance is equal to a constant number divided by the distance the point source is away from the surface. Now, the first thing you have to do is rearrange that equation into the following. And you can cross multiply to give you I times d squared is going to equal to a constant value. Now, once we get that equation, we can write down the following. We can say that, uh, therefore, the first irradiance times the first distance the light source is away from it, squared, should always equal the second irradiance multiplied by the second distance, all squared. So that leads on from that first equation. So there's the equation. And you just have to simply plug in the numbers. Now we're told the first irradiance is I. So we can put down I for the first irradiance. The first distance has got to be a value of 0 0.05. So we've got to multiply that by 0 0.50 all squared. And that should equal the second irradiance, which is given the symbol uh, I2, times the second distance squares. We've moved it to 1.5 metres, so we have to multiply that by 1.5 all squared. So to get I2, all we have to do is divide both sides by 1.5 squared. So the initial irradiance times 0 0.50 all squared and divided by 1.5 all squared. And that should give us the second irradiance what we're after. Now, if you do the numerical value of that, you get I times 0 0.11. That's what the two numbers divide out to be. And that's equal to the second irradiance. So we're looking for the second irradiance to be 0 0.11 times the first irradiance, and that's got to be A. Question 13 from section 1 of the 2018 Higher Physics Examination. Waves from two coherent sources, S1 and S2, produce an interference pattern. Maxima are detected at the positions shown. The path difference between S1 and P and S2 and P is 154 millimetres. And we're asked to find what the wavelength is. Now the key point here is knowing that at any maxima, uh, you're going to get a certain amount of wavelengths. So for example, that's your central maxima. The first maximum here, you're going to have a path difference of one wavelength. Your second maximum, two wavelengths. Third maximum, three wavelengths. Fourth maximum, four wavelengths. And fifth maximum, five wavelengths. So we know at that particular point, the path difference should be equal to five wavelengths. So the path difference should be equal to five whole wavelengths to give you a fifth maximum at that point P. But what is the physical path difference? The physical path difference is 154 millimetres. So that must be equal to five whole wavelengths. So we divide by five, we get 154 millimetres. Divided by five. And that's going to give us a wavelength of 30.08 millimetres. 
So, one wavelength is 30.8 millimetres, which is going to give us an answer, D. Question 14 from Section 1 of the 2018 Higher Physics Examination. A ray of monochromatic light passes from an air into a block of glass as shown. The wavelength of this light in air is 6.30 times 10 to minus 7 metres. The refractive index of the glass for this light is 1.50. And what we're asked to find is the frequency of this light in the glass. Well, an important fact. The frequency of a ray of light doesn't change when going from one medium into another. So the frequency of that light in the air will be exactly the same as the frequency of it in the glass. So our only job is to find the frequency of the wave in the air. And we do that by using our V equals F lambda. So we can rearrange to find the frequency. Therefore, the frequency we can find by saying it's equal to V divided by the wavelength. The speed of light is going to be V, which we call in air 3 times 10 to the power 8. We'll leave out the units for the moment. Divided by the wavelength, we're told the wavelength is 6.30 times 10 to the minus 7 of a metre. And if we do that in our calculator, we get a frequency of this light in the air to be 4.76 times 10 to the power 14 hertz. That's units for frequency. Now, that's the frequency of this ray of light in the air. But as we said before, the frequency of light does not change from going from one medium into another. So the frequency of that light in the glass box, in the glass block, will be 4.76 times 10 to the 14th.